you know, Brian, uh, you talked about uh, that lab reports and scientific evidence doesn't come in within no. the 15 minutes that you see in CSI. No. D d submitting, submitting just a blood, a, a blood sample. Say we have to, we draw blood from 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 the suspect. We send that off for examination for alcohol content or drug content. That can take four to six, four to six months at months? times. Yes. Welcome to Shooting Straight with Brad and David. I'm Brad Carline, your Navajo County attorney, and unfortunately, Sheriff Klaus is unable to join us this month, but he's sent. I'm Brian Swanty, I'm the Chief Deputy for the Navajo County Sheriff's Office. In this episode of Shooting Straight, it's the third in a continuation of talking about what goes into the investigation of major cases from the point of the 911 call until the charging of the case. We've covered that 911 call mm -hmm. to begin with, we've covered crime scene uh, and uh, recovering evidence from the crime scene, interviewing the suspect in the case, and things of like that. So you gathered all this information. Now what, what do you do with it? Right. So the next big thing is is taking all of that information, the the initial response, the the processing of the crime scene, the interviewing of the of the witnesses, uh, interviewing of the suspect, and you got to take all that, and you got to put it on paper. You got to put it into a report. That's the part they don't show on TV because <laughs> that's boring. But you've got that's the critical piece of if it's not documented. It didn't happen. So that's where your office needs that, needs that completed package. Well, it might be boring. It's critical. It's critical, absolutely. But he also talked about, you know, like that first officer on the scene, the adrenaline's running, it's chaotic. Mm -hmm. How do they remember all the details? Well, it's a combination of things, really. Uh, one is experience. You know to pay attention to detail. Number two, they have the resource of their body camera that they can go back and watch the video, see what they did, who they talked to, what was said. On occasion, what specifically said is vitally important. Almost a quote, if you will, from the body camera. Uh, a spontaneous utterance of, of anger, I, I did it because of X, uh, can become hugely important to your prosecutors. Part of what we have to prove is not only that they did it, why they did it, right. intent. Intent has a huge impact in our, in our prosecution. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things, the body camera, their memory, their notes, as soon as we're done, we start, we take notes. We convert those notes into reports. The reports are an explanation chronologically of what every deputy did. And it could be something as simple as, I responded and helped secure the scene. I put up crime scene tape and took notes of who right. entered and who left yeah, and when. As a prosecutor, I want to know everybody who was there, right. what their role was, why they were there, even if they did nothing, as you yeah. said, I stood guard to make sure nobody entered. And the defense right. has a right to know and potentially interview those deputies or officers that are there, uh, along with the really detailed ones. The case agent, for example, on a particular case, that's the person who's responsible for putting that case together, working with the prosecutor directly, and then compiling everybody's reports, all those supplements together, and presenting the package to the prosecutor for charging consideration. And that's our key point in contact from the prosecutor. And when he does this, that is, oh. that's, ab that's legitimate. Sometimes it's three binders yes. Sometimes like this. Sometimes it's 12 or more. That, that are this full of that documentation of what the, what the officer, the investigation revealed. Especially if it's a financial crime. You've given me <laughs> those <laughs> banker's boxes. Yes, I have, I have. I've worked cases upwards of four and a half years before I'm able to actually file charges. Uh, you have to be very thorough, very tedious, and very detailed. Right. No, but these big cases, they're, they take a while, just that time. It could take a day or so before you get that crime scene process, before you get done with the interview of the suspect, interview of all the potential witnesses. How many days may it take before the, these reports get written? Well, let's, put, let's start off here. The kind of a rule of thumb with Every 15 minutes of interview is about an hour's worth of typing. So you start thinking about, you're never going to have a 15 minute interview. You're going to have an hour, four hours of, of a potential interview. And that, in a, in a major case, a homicide case like that, that's typically those have got to be transcribed over. Uh, and then collecting everything from everybody. I mean, when you say days, it's, it's weeks. 
and sometimes even longer to get these things put together. But yet if we arrested the suspect, we got 48 hours to charge. Right. How are we getting charging done if you don't even have all your reports done? Sure, one of the key things we do is that working directly with one of your prosecutors. We're communicating constantly, and we do what's called a charging summary mm -hmm. with the key details that show the probable cause, enough that the prosecutor's comfortable either doing a direct complaint or later after that, a grand jury uh, presentation. And we'll talk in a minute about the difference between grand jury and direct complaint. But one of the important reasons that you call that prosecutor to the scene is they're in the middle. Right. They're hearing everything. Even though it may not be in your crime summary or in a report yet, they've learned of this information, learned the evidence that they can then feel comfortable charging somebody within that right. short time frame. Because if it's a homicide, the majority of the time, we don't want them on the street because they're a potential they're threat. Right. They're also a flight risk. Right. So, you know, in a, in a case where there is not such a potential threat to the community, I don't mind as much waiting for your reports to catch up. But on these homicides or ag assaults, the shootings, right. we don't want them out there. Absolutely. So that's why it's a key that law enforcement get that prosecutor involved right. early. Even in a nonviolent crime, we may never make an arrest. It may go straight into court without ever being arrested. They may get a summons booking. But if, in a case of violence or, or a risk of flight, we make a decision to make arrest jointly, right. typically. And that arrest, again, is not, we're not imposing punishment. That's not our role. It, it, it's for the flight risk or for the public threat. And that's what the judges are supposed to look at at the release hearing. Two factors. Are they a threat to the community? Kind of what level? And are they a flight risk? And if they're neither, they should be released. Right. Or if they're one or more, then they have to figure out what is a balance for setting a bond or a bail uh, to ensure their their uh, returning to court and the protection of the community. Right. That's what they're looking at. Um, you know, Brian, uh, you talked about uh, that lab reports and scientific evidence doesn't come in within no. the 15 minutes that you see in CSI. No. D d submitting, submitting just a blood, a, a blood sample. Say we have to, we draw blood from, from, from a suspect. We send that off for examination for alcohol content or drug content. That can take four to six, four to six months at months? times. Yes. Uh, DNA can sometimes take upwards to a year, depending on the backlog that's taking place in the in the uh, at the crime lab. There's a state crime lab, and all the agencies send their stuff to them. We're and all screaming priority. Absolutely, and everybody's is the hot uh, is the priority case. But even an autopsy, uh, how long can an autopsy take? And, and you often go down and watch them. Yes. So, and, and one of your prosecutors yeah. will join me. Yes. Um, we'll be there when the pathologist is doing the examination. It gives us a huge benefit to be able to ask questions and see firsthand what the doctor sees. Right. Uh, and also, the prosecutor is prepared to know what that doctor could testify to if we get into trial. And one of the things that I like about having the prosecutor at the crime scene, or at least at the command station, at the autopsy is he or she actually sees and when you see it, it's easier to relate it to right. the jury because you know what was there. You can visualize it besides what's in the photographs. You're there at the autopsy. You understand what that pathologist is doing and saying, and you can explain it so much better. In fact, I, I send my young prosecutors to basic detective schools right. just so they understand from your perspective what you're doing and why you're doing it so that they can explain to right. the jury and they can understand like we're doing on, on these last three shows, yeah. how we go from broad to specific and, and, and work our way down and try not to miss things. And there's no replacement for experience. So yeah. I've done hundreds of autopsies and I still learn. I, I inquire with that physician to learn from them. And as technology changes, we can get more information and more details. Right. It's just amazing what we can do. Uh, how about the, the technology, cell phones? Because you talked about downloading them, and I think you talked, Bruce, about it's really taking an image of what they look like. You're not manipulating anything. That's how long can it take for a download? So it depends on the device, the size, yeah, the size of the device. 
Uh, it also depends on if there's any features that are security features in the device that may pro prohibit or prevent us. Then I need a higher level of expert to get through that, through the, through the court order process. I mean, most all of us have some type of security code on our phone. Uh, many of those phones are capable of being bypassed with our forensic tools, but, but some, some are not. Aren't, yeah. So again, it just depends. You, you, can, you can sit for months waiting for trying to, trying to get access into that. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not like hackers you see on television where it's just instantly done. It is, it's, a, it's a process. They're, they're, those are items of security, just as my wallet is or my credit card or what have you. And, and sometimes those are very difficult to, to get into. Sometimes we can't get into them because they're damaged or, or they, uh, uh, you know, for some reason we can't get into them. And you just mentioned your credit card, which leads me to sometimes there's a financial impact. Right. I remember one case where the defendant bought the gun the weekend before. Yes. And you're having to track that down. And, and I want evidence that shows that, yeah, they bought it. So it's a credit card in their name. Going to that store, if they got video evidence, especially a gun store, can we identify it was really them? How long does it take to get financial institution information? And financial institution information can take months also. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll write the court order, we'll send it off, it has to go to their legal representative, be reviewed by their legal team, then someone on their legal team sends it to subpoena compliance or search warrant compliance, gathers all the records. If we're fortunate, they send it to us electronically. If we're not, they send it to us in a banker's mind. <laughs> and then I'm seeing more and more cases where there's text messages and social media, some people think, okay, I deleted it from my phone and it's gone. You know, yes. be it a Facebook post or a Snapchat that they think disappears in a few minutes. How it's, long does it take to get that stuff? It's like an onion, you know, you peel back the layers with that court order, the, the service provider gives us the records and sometimes they give us the records in computer code and we have to use what they describe to us uh, through some translation, if you will, to take the computer code and create what's in text. Uh, so that takes time to one by one convert each of those computer codes into the text and then to digest it into a legible or a readable format so your prosecutor can understand. Here's what the sender uh, sent, here's what the reader received. And then you have to know what the date and time is at the location where it was done or some other time by the place where that social media company is at. Correct. Fortunately, nowadays we have software that helps us digest that information and put it into a quick readable format. And each of these requests take a separate search warrant, doesn't it? Correct. Yes. I can't do one blanket search warrant to Facebook, Snapchat, Verizon. Right. They're all individual and it requires unique reports or court orders being written and presented in to the judge. gun store and yeah. everything else. Right. Yeah, it gets right. very convoluted. So, so at some point in time, the prosecutor feels comfortable about charging. Yes. And you mentioned earlier, Bruce, that there's a direct complaint or a grand jury indictment. Right. I guess you want to try to address sure. the two? So uh, working with the prosecutor, we'll discuss what is the best avenue. Uh, sometimes under time limits, we need to do a direct complaint, which means that the prosecutor, once we made the arrest, the prosecutor puts uh, the information in a charging document. And we'll typically take it before a judge and swear it and have it charged. And then it goes to the jail and the jail knows that this person has been officially charged. Uh, sometimes and the, that's the direct complaint. That's the direct complaint right. process. So we've learned from TVs and movies that there's due process rights, that, that the state has to show that there's probable cause to believe that this defendant committed all the elements of the different uh, charges in that complaint. Correct. What is the probable cause method in a direct complaint? So typically that charging summary that we give identifies or explains to the prosecutor the intent, what the charge is, and we've discussed at least what we know and what we can prove to a prosecutor, and they help us identify, you know, we, we all know the intent, we've been trained in it from the academy. Uh, certainly a detective who's been around longer can recognize whether this is a manslaughter or this is a first degree murder. Uh, we will charge or arrest on those charges, but you, as the prosecutor, may decide, well, I'm going to reduce that down based upon what I see as the intent. Because and, there may not be evidence to support what we, what we thought there was. Or at least that the prosecutor is comfortable with. Right. And if there's a direct complaint, that probable cause format 
for the defendant to challenge probable cause is called a preliminary hearing. And, uh, and that can be done before a justice of the peace in the jurisdiction where the crime occurred or a superior court judge as we typically do in Navajo County now. And at those preliminary hearings, the defendant's present along with an attorney and they can cross-examine the witness or witnesses that we put on for that and they have a chance to do what's called an offer of proof to the judge saying, judge, if you would let us present evidence, here's the evidence we would present, and that's why I would prove that there isn't probable cause. Then the other way you talked about was the grand jury. How, how do you play a role in that grand jury? So I've, I've done both. Uh, grand jury, typically I'm called to come in before the grand jury, and I give testimony based upon questions that are asked of me by the prosecutor, and I respond to those questions to provide that probable cause to the grand jury. And then on occasion, upon conclusion, the grand jurors may have a separate individual and unique question that they ask. Factual questions for you. Correct. And legal questions for the prosecutor that's presenting the case. Right, I don't, I don't uh, provide any of the legal, I only respond as a witness. And in a grand jury, there's usually 16 citizens of the county who are sitting as the judge, in a sense, to determine whether probable cause exists. At random, and they may, if they know me, they may excused, be excused from uh, being a juror. Right. I've Conflict. had that happen. Or, or they know the defendant or any of the potential witnesses. Right. Right. But the defendant nor the defendant's attorney are present in a grand jury typically. Not in grand jury, and grand jury is secret. Even the court orders or the subpoenas that are presented to grand jury are protected. Right. But a defendant, if they know they're under investigation, can ask the grand jurors to listen to their testimony if they wish. Correct, and I would not be present if that were the case. And if either the judge in a preliminary hearing or the grand jury, a majority of them, in, a, in the grand jury proceedings, find probable cause, then we move on from there and the defendant is gonna be in the superior court system. Yeah, then, then we serve them with an indictment. We have civil deputies yeah. that will go up and may serve that individual. They may get a summons booking, something like that. Thank you for joining us on this three-part series explaining how law enforcement and prosecution work together from the 911 call until charges are filed and probable cause found against the defendant. So thank you for joining us on Shooting Straight with Brad and David. We hope you enjoy the, these three segments.